Today's episode of the Inside EVs podcast is brought to you by E-Range EV Tire. E-Range EV Tires are specifically engineered for electric vehicles. Using an advanced manufacturing process called liquid phase mixing, E-Range EV's EcoPoint 3 technology creates a tire with lower rolling resistance and longer range, while offering low levels of wear and high grip. All this while staying affordable. Go to erangetires.com. That's E-R-A-N-G-E, tyres.com, to find your EV's next set of tyres. Happy Friday, everyone. It's Inside EV's podcast day. Hooray! Uh, hello, hello, Internet. Uh, as ever, welcome to Friday. It's the end of your week, which means you can start it if you're in America, learning all about the goings on of the EV space. Uh, as ever, I'm your host, Alex Goy, and today I am joined by Miss Go Electric. Lacey, how are you doing? I'm great. I know this you looks a little bit different, guys. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee, and we're actually going to talk about that a little bit because I drove my Rivian down here. But yeah, we, we, yes, we are this is a new some... setup. We're going to do some proper riff in Rivian, which I still yes. maintain should be a sting. Uh, and joined by Hazel Southwell. How are you? I, I'm all right. I apologise if I'm a bit croaky this week. Um, I've uh, been ill, um, but uh, but I'm going to power through it. So, yes. As, as Britain catapults itself back as far into the past as uh, the, the elderly people on your Facebook uh, feed want to be, <laughs> Hazel has contracted a Victorian disease. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, I suppose there's no better time than the present to get cracking with EV news. EV news. There's been a motor show in japan in tokyo our wonderful uh, leader patrick is there which is why he can't be with us right now because i believe he's trapped on a bus of some sort um but yeah patrick has been covering the japan mobility show uh where basically everything's kind of kicking off the first order of business is the uh, toyota epu compact truck concept it's got a pass-through bed it's about the size of a ford maverick uh it's been designed for the more casual user so you've got outdoor ho uh, hobbies i've almost said hobbits there you've got outdoor hobbits um you live in the city you should keep them outdoors it's cruel to keep them indoors i mean they've okay. got furry feet so you know they're supposed yeah. to be there um we're gonna measure uh, yeah. how many habits can fit in the truck bed <laughs> yeah. new measurement to find out. new measurement um it's just like yeah designed for for active lifestyle people as so many cars are um, but people who live in the city who don't necessarily have loads of space, which is cool. It's got a short nose. Um, it's based on a monocoque rather than a, a, a ladder. And uh, yeah, that that magic load bed, uh, it's four and a half feet. But if you do the pass through thing, it goes to six feet. And if you lower the uh, lower the back, uh, it goes to eight feet. Now, Lacey, as our as our uh, American in residence for today, um, what do you make of this? A few things that I like to see about this. I think, you know, I love the Maverick. So I think that there should be more entries in this space of a small pickup truck. Um, you know, when I was at the Ford F-150 Lightning uh, unveiling at their, like, the first one rolling off the line, Jim Farley actually came up to me and he was telling me, because I was like, hey, Maverick seems to be doing well. And he's like, yeah, it's just a Ford Focus. I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah, you're actually right. It is a Ford Focus because they retooled that plant to just use the same chassis and throw a new hat on it. And so why it's, not? It's... If you can do it for a, a cost effective manner, come out with a small truck like that, that meets some needs of people that are looking for a lower price point, but can still get the utility out of it. I love the mid gate feature. I love that like longer that tailgate thing that you're showing right now, Danny, is like having that back end part fold up so that you can keep things contained. So you don't necessarily have to buy an extra like accessory for the back of it like you would in, in my truck in the R1T. But, um, you know, I, I like this thing. I think, you know, the design is a little funky, but I think it works. Um, I think it works just fine. I like it. Yeah, I mean, I, yoke, I guess yoke is weird, but I've heard that Toyota does the yoke well. So, 
Yeah, I, no, yeah, I've I've had the the Toyota Lexus yoke is it's not a bad yoke. It's but ha, it's not a bad yoke. Oh, I yeah. happy Friday. It's been it's been a week. <laughs> it's been a week. Um, yeah, no, yoke is good. I kind of like the look. It's a bit subdued. Um, it's not like this is at EV, which now looks like it looks like a spaceship. It looks it looks kind of quite a little bit like those Hondas we were talking about the other week that don't necessarily look hugely. Uh, out there it looks like a car but it's designed for utility and uh and practicality the cool thing is though where uh, this is electric where the maverick very much yes. isn't um yeah only do you, think, do you think it would be do you think that would work for that section of the market we're talking hobbyists we're talking city living um would that do you reckon that would sell I, I mean, I think so. Obviously, I'm I'm not American, um, but like, you're not. I, you do surprise me. No, I know. Um, <laughs> but like from my understanding of of kind of a lot of these smaller pickup trucks that people buy, um, there's yeah. If you live in a city, then you're going to have a significant interest in not having something gas guzzling because there are even in the US, you know, lots of lots of um restrictions on bringing bigger vehicles or more um, more polluting vehicles into cities mm -hmm. um and for something that is probably a weekend ride and it is something that you take out when you're you know going to the lakes or like going to a park or something and you yeah. need to take stuff around yeah i can i can see this um my slight question would be like why it, i don't know that people are going to go for it from toyota right um like because there are ford mavericks and, and stuff like i i don't i don't know if that's i don't know if it feels like a toyota segment i was actually really disappointed we were chatting just before the podcast and i when they said it said compact truck um, I initially thought this was going to be like a K truck, uh, yes. and uh, I'm like, why is it so big? Um, but yeah, I, I like I can definitely see a purpose for for something like this, and and for people who want to have that space and mm. and utility, but don't don't want to be burning fuel, you know. Yeah, I, it yeah, is, and I it hear is a good. So many people say to me, like, I just want to sit up a little bit higher. Like, I, they like to have that. Maybe they don't need all the utility out of a full-size truck or even something like, you know, a Tacoma or something like that. But um, does this have a frunk? Is there a frunk? Uh, I don't believe so. Let me check real quick. Hang on. Hold, please call it. That'd be nice just to add some more, you know, space to it if they could, depending no. on how that power plant set up but... but bear in mind this is this is our concept so basically all, all the yeah. big news that's that's come out of the mobility show is it's a concept we're going to be talking a lot about concepts today and the wonderful thing about a concept is you can literally say anything yes. um that's you know in a, in in a sort of elon musk way yeah it's going to fly and it's it's uh it'll it'll massage you it'll make you an espresso and a martini in the evening um so you know 600 miles happens, of range 600 miles of range <laughs> At uh, all solid state. Yeah. 30, 30 miles per kilowatt hour. Don't you worry about that. We've got you covered. Um, How many so, concepts does Toyota have out now? Because remember that day where they had like 30 or something like that shown? Oh, 11 like, T gajillion, I think, is yes. the official number. Please I mean, it does feel a bit like they're just throwing stuff at the wall to see what will eventually stick, uh, which to be honest, it's kind of true of a lot of things that Toyota is doing around like cars in general. Um, but including their sort of like flip-flopping around like, well, we're going to do hydrogen and you know, combustion. And... Um, uh, but I mean, this one, this looks quite full-fledged. Like mm, yeah. a lot of manufacturers would be like, hello, here's our new car. Um, you, you can't see through the windows because they're not real. It's a solid brick. <laughs> uh but yeah like like it, it looks i don't i don't know if it's actually got a battery in that chassis or, or or that it would actually run um but to all intents and purposes it, it looks like a functional truck um with features that are like pragmatic 
uh, yeah. compared to you know like I love glistening weird uh, concepts where they're obviously kind of like yeah this is what you know BMWs are going to look like in like 2050 when they're all oh, like yeah. strange and little pebbles or something all, like all the wheels are 3d printed intricately from a yeah. single blob <laughs> of mercury uh speaking of weird <laughs> concepts though uh still with toyota because obviously it's japan mobility show uh the ftse sports car concept is pretty cool um a bit like the honda eny1 that it's not supposed to be called anyone but it's the anyone um anyone who's anyone again who's uh who's heard any sort of banking news why have they named it the FTSE because that just makes me think of stocks and shares um it's a deeply cool looking thing it's a very very cool car but the the most interesting thing the cool thing is it's uh it may go into production after 2026 which is when the Lexus LFZC is due to go use the same battery pack and this is coming from Hideki Leader who's the uh, project manager of the GR Design Group and the man who penned the orange beastie in front of you. So the idea is the Lexus is going to go, uh, Lexus is going to go first and then uh, the, the Toyota will go after that. Now, the really cool thing about this is that it's a desirable electric sports car of which there are currently not many. Um, I think it looks mega. It's got, it's got hints of, of Lotus Evora, um, I would say that because I love a Lotus Evora. It's got uh, a little bit of like very old Nissan GTR concept for the R35 mm. from like 2005 or whenever they first revealed it. Um, it's got little bits of everything. Uh, I, I think it looks mega and it will turn weird petrol heads like me onto, onto EVs because it doesn't appear to be one of these you need to spend nine million pounds and then you could have 2000 horsepower instead mm. it'll have a uh, sensible you know a sensible power and it looks really good what do we think friends i think you're right in that it's it's the kind of thing where it's like i mean obviously sports cars as a concept are not like quote unquote affordable um no. and they are like a ridiculous buy but if I was thinking about getting another divorce, then I can imagine myself um, <laughs> deciding to go in on something like this. Um, uh, but hell yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's Southwell's a... back in town with the footsie, or as, oh, as yeah. Greg, Greg Bonds has put um, in, the, uh, in the comments, is that the footsie as in the stock index, or footsie as in the thing you play with people under dinner tables? <laughs> Greg definitely coined mm. a good one. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, yes, uh, it, it could be the the financing or the cause of the purchasing. Um, no, uh, uh, yeah, I think I think like Alex says, it's 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 a. I actually, what's nice is that I, the front end really looks like a Toyota. Um, mm. And like, I don't necessarily think of like Toyota as a huge sports car brand, but this looks Toyota shaped to me. Um, and yeah, I, it, if they make this, people will buy it. And yeah. if they make it and they make it, you know, I don't know, 70 grand or something, then then, yeah, a lot of people will buy it. I mean, if, if they go with the with the and this is kind of pulling it into into ICE land. If they go with the similar ethos that they had with the the GT eighty six, the eighty six, even to a point the um, the A ninety Supra, where it's 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 set up and designed specifically for people who like to drive but don't you know. So the the A ninety is perhaps a little bit more extreme because you can get ridiculous power out of the engine in that. But the the eighty six. The whole ethos of it is that it's light. The tires are super skinny. They were Prius tires on the original. So you could do little skids and get away with it and have movement in the car. Um, but the power was modest. So you wouldn't get yourself into trouble. And I reckon mm -hmm. if they bring a little bit of that, I mean, you need a with, with any EV, especially when you're trying to conquest customers from, you know, A90 Supras into an EV, it will need to have a little bit of look at this, look at all the power, look at how quick this is, look at the, the the incredibleness that this can do. But if you have a little bit of that playability, a little bit of that accessibility, 
it will also appeal to the people who want the big power but don't necessarily know how to use it. Because EVs are fun to drive. Like, they're yeah. very responsive. Like, you can... Having it... Like, we... I expect all of us have at some point had a go in a Nissan Leaf and like they're really fun to throw around a bit. Yeah. Um, and part of that is is because you can floor it because it doesn't have a huge amount of power. Yeah. Um, which again, if this doesn't have ridiculous, you know, um uh like thousand horsepower kind of like Batista <laughs> style stuff, yeah. then then it will be much easier to engage that and to feel like you've got a silly little sports car um but also like it, it would it doesn't take a lot to make an ev feel sporty provided yeah. it's it's quite small um which this certainly seems to be and and so yeah i can see this being really fun on, on quite yeah. a low effort basis <laughs> <laughs> it's it is is it a rear drive is it b decently powerful but not so much it'll scare your mother and <laughs> C, engaging to drive. And when you look at the man who was and sort of still is at the top, Akio Toyota, he's a driver. Like, he signs off cars. He is he is uh, one of the Toyota Motor Company's master drivers. And th these guys, like, know the intricacies of absolutely everything. Um, so He still goes racing. Yeah, because he's awesome. Akio Toyota is an absolute G. He's wicked. I, I, I should never say that again, but you know what I mean. Absolutely, he's just—he's so cool. Um, so yeah, it, I I have big high hopes for for this car. I hope it comes out, and when it comes out, I want to go. Um, they said it's more. supposed to, right? In twenty twenty six, yeah. like after twenty twenty six, and they, so they, like the pickup truck is like kind of like a thing that is probably going to go into production so the two we're yeah. talking about today although they're concepts like well they, they, they said so so this one may go into production that's the that's the quote that that we've got it may possibly happen a bit i imagine it's like when you you say to your parents oh can we please get that new thing for the house and they go we'll see yeah. you full know it's gonna happen but it's not quite there yet um one more story from the japan mobility show uh, again, it's a sports car, so I'm about to get very animated. Sorry, internet. It's the Mazda Iconic SP. Oh, no. Concept. You like cool cars? I know. Get off the podcast, Alex. I know. Yes. Sorry. You're Sorry. fired. I'll, I'll, I'll be excited elsewhere. No, I'm going to get very animated about this one um, because uh, it is an EV, but it's got two rotary engines in it. <laughs> um, this so is the most a... Mazda thing. That it's Mazda a two could possibly have rotor ever made. EV system. The 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 engineering behind this, I don't quite get how, but uh, yeah. So it's um, the batteries are, are recharged are charged by recyclable energy sources, and the two ro two rotor rotary engine uh, is used for power generation and is powered by carbon neutral fuel. So says the press release. Uh, it utilizes a highly scalable rotary engine that can burn various fuels such as hydrogen, generates electricity with carbon neutral fuel. Uh, in addition, uh, when the battery is charged with it, uh, sorry, when the battery is charged with electricity derived from renewable energy, it's possible to drive in a virtually carbon neutral state. So essentially guilt free hooliganism. Uh, and also look at this thing. It is stunning. Uh, you know, people have been saying all over the internet, this is a Mazda MX-5, it's the next Miata, or it's the next RX-7, or next RX, RX-8. Um, it could be, they say, the power's about 365 horsepower. Um, it's longer, wider, longer wheelbase than ND uh, Miata, but it weighs just 1,450 kilos, or 3,196 pounds. Now, bear in mind, uh, the lightest Lotus in Mira is something like 1,405 kilos, and that's got a full ICE set up in it. So, oh, someone speaking of ICE, there's someone driving past <laughs> yeah. my house using it. Apologies, London. Right on cue. Right Paid on actor. cue. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it's obviously it's a concept. Uh, oh. Obviously, obviously, the you know, it's it, it's not the next Miata. It's not the MX-5. But how cool would it be if it appeared? Or if a production car appeared like that, what do we think, friends? Immediately, uh -huh. yes. 
as the kids say. Immediately yes. I, I approve. I yes. Approve. Uh, yes, please. Uh, come on, Mazda. Like, if you came out with, I mean, I'm not really into the hydrogen thing for this kind of use case. Whatever. Um, I don't, I just don't see it as a viable option for passenger vehicles for the most part, unless there's some kind of strange advancement in the technology that makes it more efficient, but it's just, just give it to me in a battery electric, you know, give it, give it to me as a Bev. Um, and mm -hmm. I'd be very happy. Oh, that picture makes me smile so much. A cute little Miata. Like, I think so many people in the EV community are like, give us a Miata that's electric. And I think this looks like um, incredible. Like, if they mm. came out with this, holy smokes. Like, I think they would I, I'd sell sell all of them in a in the mm -hmm. BEV format. Um, all of them. I just, it just, it's kind of like, all of them gone. Yes. I just think it's kind of sad because it's just like, I just don't think it's gonna happen or like if they do come out with it, it i'll be disappointed i don't know that's just a feeling i hope i'm wrong but oh i mean i, think I, I the, love it so much as a as, as a as a kind of counterpoint to 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 a, an all-electric miata right now um is that people will want it to do 200 miles and they'll want it to be as light as an nd or an nc perhaps not an na where there's weight of a bag of crisps but at the moment perhaps the tech to do all the things isn't quite there so maybe this rex version is a good stopgap at least for a generation maybe what do you think hazel look i there's a time and a place for series hybrids and it's in the middle of dakar not like the panamera you know the Carmo Rivero. <laughs> those are fine. yeah i just i don't understand why if That's you're trying to make a little lightweight sports car concept, you're going like, well, first we'll chuck like, okay, rotary engines, very small. They're, you know, the efficiency, they're very easy to package, whatever. But then you're chucking in um, a hydrogen uh, ready fuel tank. Apparently that weighs a lot. Um, you're um, chucking in two engines and at the end of the day, they're just charging a battery. That, like, what? Um, the the charging mechanism aside, uh, because I don't see what's wrong with just plugging in the battery and then you don't have all the weight of any of that stuff or the packaging of any of that stuff or any of the problems uh, that all of that stuff causes. Um, yeah, I mean, I do think people would buy this. Uh, it, I kind of think it's a bit ugly, but in a way that I like. Like, like a, what, in, 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 endearingly ugly, confidently yeah, ugly. Yeah, it's sort, sort, sort of sort like of... an ugly pet, you know? Um, like like, like, like Crookshanks the cat. It, yeah, Everyone like, says that like, my, my dog is ugly because she's hairless. And I like her. So, like, yeah, it's sort of, it's got that kind of, like, stubbiness to it. Like like having a corgi or something, you know? Um, uh, but I, to be honest, my, my problem with Mazda is mostly that it doesn't seem to be able to like, like I don't understand why it either doesn't work on making lightweight rotary engines that run on um, clean in huge square, scare quotes fuels um, like green hydrogen. It's very energy inefficient and, and as Lacey says it it's something i've got a lot of reservations about however there's a lot of funding from the japanese government to to push forward hydrogen because th there's a lot of um uh push from the oil and gas industry to do that um and to me if they're not ready to make like a proper bev then they should be working on on making those efficient like it, it, because you know Mazda's efficiency, it's light weighting. These little cars are, are things that it's always been very good at. People love its rotary engines. Um, I, I just I, I don't really. It feels like the same way that a, a lot of Japanese manufacturers, and I know we talk about Toyota a lot because obviously they're the biggest manufacturer at OEM in the world. Um, but Honda and Nissan and and Mazda are all kind of doing the same thing as well where they're sort of like mm, what if we do it all 
And it's like, well, what, what, so what if you have your cake and eat it too, but at low or zero emissions? No, I feel you. Did you see the infinity um, concept? That's, no. of course, another like low slung sports card vibes type thing. That one looked pretty cool too. But it's again, oh, yeah, it's like, I like that one. Uh, it's like, oh, come on, guys, let's go. Let's let's bring some EVs Makes to the market. Thing. Let's do, do it. I, I will say with the Mazda, um, my buddy Rob Dom, if anybody knows, he's a big YouTuber. He had an RX7 and he like is always working on his cars and stuff like that. But he, uh, I would love if they come out with that that concept we just saw, like they need to do a video with him and have him be a hooligan in that. That'd be awesome. <laughs> and, and do a playing. Well, um, I love it. I, I think it's great. Uh, I, it's I want one. I would like them to make it. But from good EV news to yeah, see, look less at that. Sorry. good <laughs> EV news, um, GM's having a bad week. <laughs> Brutal. GM is not having a great time. So, uh, yeah, the first thing we kind of need to talk about is GM and Honda are, are parting ways. Um, you know, the, the deal to make the Prologue and the ZDX um, was supposed to lead to lots more. And they've both decided to call that quits. Uh, reactions, please, folks. Like, I, I was I was with some Americans when this news broke and there was incredulity and some swearing. So... <laughs> Honestly, do think, I, don't, I, I don't think that it's like... I don't know. I have mixed emotions about it because it's like, I think it was cool that they were going to try to come up with some cost savings in order to, to produce an affordable EV. But it just seems like, like okay, so... In that relationship, assuming that GM is supposed to provide the Ultium platform, what is Honda providing in the technology front or like in that? I just don't. They're both huge producers of automobiles. So it's like for me, it was a little harder to see what the advantage of partnering together was. Um, of course, it's disappointing because we want affordable EVs on the market. So from that point of view i i wish that they could come up with a way to make it happen but also i think that they're all both going to be able to within the coming years produce their own on their own which mm. provides more affordability to the market and more options in their own space so i think they can still do it in a sense that cost wise it it's viable for both of both parties yeah especially when we see that that you know gm's produced the bolt for so long and it's done you know fairly well considering it's a great car and mm. i don't know we've seen honda e although that's not that great of range but it is a freaking cool little car <laughs> yeah I, I i i sat down with one of the the honda product managers in the uk and uh when talking about the the anyone um i really think they need to put a question mark at the end of that car's name the honda <laughs> anyone anyone want one um and uh i remember the launch they were very confident that it was going to be like this car that goes everywhere and does all the things and then he said well it was a dip in it was it was it was a, it was a dip in the water to see what we could do we were just testing to see what happened yeah you charged 40 grand for for a very cute thing but yeah uh hazel what do you what do you make to this news um i think it's unfortunate for honda because being able to use the oem platform in the us or to be able to use um, like I'm assuming that although this kind of like subsequent affordable EV platform would basically take advantage of, of the OEM partnership um, and so would be able to produce uh, to, to use that kind of US built stuff in order to produce EVs there. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's unfortunate for Honda that, that it's not going ahead because that's infrastructure that would have been convenient for them especially given you know the the localized protectionist policies um in terms of of ev discounts and incentives um and also i mean i i agree um with lacy like not everything has to be stellantis like we do not have to synergize and uh find I mean, everything eventually will be stellantis they will own <laughs> all the brands yeah, um, yeah, it's like a creeping sci-fi film where everything yeah. is like. Eventually you'll, 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 you'll get into your uh, Stellant pod and go to your Stellant job, um, 
and and you will serve the great Stellantis Empire. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like a dystopian teen novel. Everyone will be assigned a Stellantis brand, uh, like fourteen or whatever. Um, uh, yes, um, citizen four five seven. You will go to Stellantis pod seven. You will work for <laughs> Dodge. This is a terrifying visual, but. Uh, I, I think this is a great concept. We should write this book. Um, <laughs> it could be the next it's, Hunger Games. It's, um, it's, it's yeah, kind of Hunger Games Ready Player One, but for like average hatchbacks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'd, I'd read it. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I, obviously it's unfortunate when car makers, which we already know are, you know, affordable EVs are not, really on the agenda to mm. a fairly major extent you know we're not seeing solid plans to bring out little affordable mid-size yeah. you know those mid-size hatchbacks um for in in the ev space um and manufacturers are struggling to find ways to to keep the price of their evs down um and we you know we've seen a lot of them having to raise the price we've seen particularly gm you know binning off the bowl and and i think i would like to think that what this meant is that honda and gm are each going to come up with a affordable ev platform and that this is you know something where it's a viable um opportunity for that realistically do i think that's what it means no what i think it means is that they cannot find a way to work together going forward in a way that makes sense um and that both of them are realizing that these efficiencies that they hoped to be able to find are significantly harder uh, than they was expecting and that does not bode well uh in terms of either company being able to move into the ev space I, d I worry about Honda a lot because, like, uh, back in 2017, they were very, very adamant that they were going EV and that they were. And then in in 2019, they were they were even more adamant that you know they're leaving F1 to to focus all that R and D on EVs. And it's 2023, and I I just I don't see where that's gone. And I know they didn't really leave F1 and whatever, but like, yeah. And, and, and what's funny is that, and then like Audi's like, we're going all electric. And so we're going to go to F1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. And, uh, okay. well, you weirdo. On or Cadillac, like. On, yeah. On, uh, on Audi and F1, I read this morning while I was having several cups of coffee that uh, Audi's F1 bid is under review. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, all that surprised. news is so interesting to me with all the drama that's going on over there mm. <laughs> but, I mean yeah. but it might be Cadillac who ends up entering who knows uh, but I, I do I just I don't there's nothing that I think is very optimistic about this news and I, I think it's difficult to put a spin on it that isn't companies are really like I think the the thing that's clear is that across the entire OEM space, companies are really struggling to make this change, and are struggling on a level that I don't think the big OEMs are expected to. Um, and I don't think you know, especially I know we talked about this last week, but like GM has put a lot in place to put all that Ultium infrastructure in, and they're still like there's still Every so many time. stumbling blocks mm. yeah um well you well, yeah so it's a bad week for gm and a bad week for honda there is a glimmer of hope for gm uh because the next gen chevy bolt is going to get a cheaper lfp battery um which uh well they basically said you know we're we're going to leverage the best of current gen ev technology you're going to get a better range which currently is 259 epa for the hatch 247 for the crossover and they're hoping to create sorry it's hoping terrible grammar gm is hoping um to uh to have a lower cost than it currently is which is already what twenty seven thousand eight hundred 
uh, dollars, which isn't much for an EV. I mean, it's a lot of money still, but you, you know what I mean. Um, so there is there is some positive. There is some positive news. The next gen bolt EV will be better or better. -er. Lacey, what's your take? I am, um, you know, excited to hear that. It is sad that the generation of the bolt that we know now is going away by the end of this year. And then there seems to be like a couple of years, maybe till it comes back as an Ultium platform. You know, I honestly, I really like the bolt in the bolt EUV. And as far as I understand it from the story that they are going to um, use the EUV platform instead of the hatchback style of the bolt and kind of build off that. So the bolt with the hatchback is going to be pretty much gone, it seems like. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I actually would have probably considered this as a holdover vehicle if when I was in the market for one, um, if it would have had all wheel drive. So that's kind of the exciting thing for me is when I'm looking towards Ultium is that they'll be able to potentially package it in a way that will give more options as far as the powertrain goes so that more markets can take advantage of or feel comfortable, I should say, because some people say, you know, so you can do a single motor. And I see bolts everywhere in Michigan because, at least, as you can imagine, there are a lot of GM and Ford products and Stellantis products around me uh, at all times. But why, why uh, on earth would that be? <laughs> weird. <laughs> Actually, you know what's kind of. I did see a Honda Prologue uh, driving it um, last week. Uh, so that was kind of like, oh, that's exciting to see that they're doing some like final testing and stuff because it was you know in it's no camo it was you know in a oh, they, they were they, they were just being like -da, they were just driving the yeah they cut co they covered up the front badge but pff, can't get past me i'm a car spotter <laughs> 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 i didn't I, get my camera out quick enough though but, i see um, I right honked through my you horn. yeah i see right through you hunter prologue i but see I, through you. I know i'm going on a tangent but i am excited for new a new bolt a more affordable option lfp i think is a uh, fine uh for this we'll see what when it comes out if they end up going with something that is a little bit more energy dense than what we know of with lfp at this stage with the news that we've been hearing from like catl and the advancement of getting that density up so you still have a little bit better range than what you typically associate that chemistry for but it'll be a better cost option for them so as long as they're making those adjustments with all the inflation and the challenge to get money at this stage um, but the bolt qualifies for a ton of incentives and um, i know right now people that are buying them are just trying to scoop them up because they can get not only the federal tax incentive but a lot of states have some incredible um, tax incentives to be able to get them super cheap this is the same way that you can now pick up a Model Y for yeah. the same as a Camry. So same, yes. <laughs> same, same, except you just exactly. get more money off. Mm -hmm. So how, how low could you get a Bolt, I wonder? Gosh, well, you get the $7,500 and then you can get in some states like five grand off. So that's, that's... like in the teens. That's crazy. Mm. That I mean, that seems like a very, very, very good idea and what basically the market's been crying out for. But no, more giant SUVs with 200 kilowatt hour battery packs, please. <laughs> Sorry, Hazel, I interrupted you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 everything that GM has done with the Bolt is really sensible and good. And apart from deciding not to do it anymore. Like, <laughs> um, the, the, you know, the, the whole process... Um, I remember I was at the virtual, because it was like COVID, uh, launch for the 2022 Bolt, um, when they introduced the EV and, and, and kind of made it a bit more SUV crossover -y. Um, and everything they were doing was so sensible. It, they had a program that was like, uh, looking after them and repurposing in the, uh, them for the, uh, like for the secondhand market um they had systematically gone through the car with a plan to reduce the price every year and to get it down to these prices to get it into the teens with tax incentives that was their plan and like they've done it it's successful <laughs> i don't understand why this one thing that they've done incredibly well is the one thing where they're like mm -hmm, mm -hmm, no oh no we, we, we the thing is we're too good we want to give everyone else who's struggling horribly like us a chance 
<laughs> yeah, because I mean, like, this is also, you know, this is where they are. They are a Tesla killer because if there is the option between a Tesla and a Bolt, a lot of people will go with the Bolt because they know, for instance, when there was an issue on Bolts, everything got replaced. Bolt owners are so happy um, and uh, like genuinely Bolt owners seem to be like one of the happiest car. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, ownership groups. The Victorian diseases once yeah, again appearing. Yeah. Thanks to <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, like, I, I just, everything about the bolt is good. Everything that GM is doing <laughs> with the bolt is good. And yeah. it shouldn't be making me angry to be saying this. Yeah. Uh, but like, yeah, it's just, why, why insist on doing stuff you're bad at instead? Bolt. Yeah, Bolt is a gateway EV. Like, there's so many people that end up getting a Bolt and then they upgrade once they're, you know, it's kind of like the Leaf. Like, when mm. I was working with the Aria, there were so many, I talked to a lot of reservation holders before it even came out and they were like, you know, I had a, I've had a Leaf for years and I love the Leaf, but now I want, I've, you know, grown in my career and I'm making a little bit more money and I want something that fits with my family. So I want the Aria now. And I think the Bolt is the same concept. It's just a shame that, What's what are the what's the thing that they can upgrade to? Oh, a Tesla. Yeah, a Tesla, you know, like brilliant. yeah, right. everyone. Exactly. exactly. It's like <laughs> we've done very well is, today. Yes. Where is the rest of the range that matches the bolt and that takes the lessons of the bolt and that is like implementing this steady driving down the price and whatever? I mean, where are the other cars? To be honest, um, and then like what? Why at this point where? you are looking at mass entry level adoption of EVs being something that is very viable and likely. Um, yeah. It's just so <laughs> frustrating. Yes. Oh no. Um, well, from, from, from source of good news, apart from the, you know, the, 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 the failure to, to keep it, keep it rolling. Uh, GM's earnings call wasn't quite done after all that. Uh, the Equinox or Equinox EV market launch has been, delayed it was supposed to start towards the end of this year but it's been pushed by a few months um they're not very good at this whole releasing evs when they said they would thing are they it's so tragic i did see one of these driving like two weeks ago too in my area and it was again not camoed and it was like this really dark gray color and it looked so good i was like damn okay equinox let's go um, but yeah, another affordable EV. It'll be probably in the 30s. You know, they said 30 to launch, but I doubt by the time this launches, they're actually going to get into a position where they can get it at that $30,000 price point. Um, but the, uh, the, the the Electric Vehicle Association has started a petition to hold GM accountable for its original $30,000 uh, entry level price point, which I think is a bold move. Hey, giant business. Do what you said you were gonna do. Like, no, mm. <laughs> no, it's it's at least at least it's not been cancelled or True. put off so until far. Yeah. twenty twenty nine. Don't curse or... it. <laughs> it's, it's too late. I've Murray Walkered it. It's this done. could be the car that you move on from your bolt to. Mm. Um, and like, yeah, this. Yeah. Um, oh God, I mean, a lot of science. Hazel's, 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 Hazel's just running out of energy for for all the all the yeah, GM. The, the, the re, I need some regen or something. Um, but yeah, it worries me a lot that these aren't the flagship cars because yeah. a lot of people will be like, "Oh, it's you know the Equinox is pushed back a few months. Who really cares?" Um, but like, this is or should be. The, the kind of mass market car. Um, and it and... just isn't. No. No. Oh, well, uh, we will eventually mm. see it. Now, before we move on to Tesla news, Lacey, we know we can see, for those of us watching the live the live stream, you're not in your massive, amazing studio with your name behind your head. You are in <laughs> a hotel room somewhere, which uh, means well... you've been driving, you've been traveling, and you've been road tripping in Eurivian. So... 
give us a little update. How's it been? What's it been doing? Do you like it? Do you have you got buyer's remorse? Do you want to fire it into the sun, or do you want to give it a big cuddle every night before you go? Giant to bed? hugs and cuddles. I love it. Um, so yes, I <laughs> yeah. do love my truck. I took it. I started my road trip from my home in Michigan and made my way down to Nashville, Tennessee, because I'm here for a work contract. So, so for those um, of us who, who don't know the layers of America, how far is that? Um, it's probably like a 10 hour drive. Um, so I think a total to get here, I drove like 600 and almost 20 miles. Okay. That's so, a long way. <laughs> it's not, it, you know, so I am going to Florida next week. So I'll have more updates as far as like how the charging's performing. When I left my house, I was at 100% and my Rivian at 100% is 410 miles of range because I have the max pack performance dual motor set up. And so my first charging stop was like, you know, three hours in and I stopped at an Electrify America station in Ohio. Did it work? Because I hear they're not terribly reliable. It did. Actually, I Yay. had no problem with uh, initiating the charging session on any of my sessions so far, except for, which is kind of abnormal. I did have an issue at um, a hotel for overnight Hi. charging, which was interesting. Uh, but I, I wrote a whole thread of this on my um, Twitter, uh, x.com, if you guys want to see the details of it. But essentially, when I plugged in, and I posted a bunch of pictures so that you guys can get all the data that you could possibly want out of it. But when I plugged into the Electrify America station, um, immediately, I was at like maybe, because I let the car program me to the location that it was, you know, I just wanted to use the in-vehicle nav so that it could determine where I'm going to stop and all that. So... It did all the work. I did double check real quick on ABRP, a better route planner, to see if it was the same from what I plugged into the app versus what was in the car because Rivian did buy ABRP. So I was like, mm, maybe they, by the time I got my car, there was some kind of update. It didn't match. So it seems like there's still some process in optimizing all that and getting that sorted and building that into the navigation more. Uh, but I wasn't disappointed. I will say that I arrived, I think at like 14 or 15% state of charge at the charging station, which I think is what the average person will probably do is right around that point. When I plugged in and initially jumped up really quickly to um, the peak rate of 208 kilowatts and the car can handle up to 220. So what was interesting is my, um, first charging session uh, was, you know, I hit the peak rate and then it dropped down to 130 kilowatts until I hit about like 45%. And then it spiked back up to 168 kilowatts. And then it sat there for a while until I got to 55 or 50%. And then it started to go down again to 155. And then at 60, it dropped to 142. But then when I got to 70, it went to 110. So it's kind of like this weird, like, and I didn't get any message from the charging or from the car because I know my car has uh, messages that will pop up if it's the charging station that throttles the charging right. or whatnot. And there was nothing on there. So I'm not sure exactly why it was if whether this was the car or if there was something else going on. I will say um, for this first part of my trip, it was like high 40s for the temperature because mm -hmm. it was a little chilly um, as far as that goes, that could be somewhat of a factor. But uh, yeah, I uh, from there charged up to about that 70% mark because I was like, you know, I, I, don't, I really didn't even need that much, I didn't think. But my car was projecting 288 miles. Um, hmm. So that was off a little about the projections, but as I started to drive, it started to jump up more and more and more. So it said I was going to arrive at my hotel, which was only 160 miles away with like 47 miles left on the right. range. But I ended up getting there with like 104 or something like that. So it was more than double. So the, the predictability as far as the, the estimates is yeah. is not as spot on as it could be, but, um, you know, I figured I'm like, I, I'm at 70, I'm going to get more than that, but we'll see what ends up happening. 
So um, I got to the hotel and I had, there were like 15 chargers there. Most of them were Tesla and there were two that were like these off-brand versions of J1772 hookup, but there was an issue because half of them were down and the hotel didn't know like how to basically reset the charging stations like because someone tripped the breaker or something. So they don't so, know how to turn it off and on again, which is how you fix all electric devices. <laughs> so I was like, this is interesting that you have so many chargers, which is awesome. And maybe the hotel is thinking like, well, people aren't using them, but no, it's because they're non-operational. Like, right. You need to get your return on investment, people. Let's get let's get this uh, up and going. Yeah, fire, fire them up, make it work. More EV drivers will come to you because you have them. Yeah, so that was kind of a disappointment, but it was fine because very close by I had a DC fast charger, another Electrify America station, and we were going to get breakfast in the morning anyway. So I actually ended up getting up to maybe like 53% state of charge. And Tim, uh, producer Tim, for those of you who don't know, who is also my partner, he drove his Model S down. And so we were both charging at the same time. So um, both of us in the middle of the night, it stopped. So then we actually went to a location where there was an EA station and a supercharger right next to each other and got breakfast. And within that time period, I got up to like 70 some odd percent or something or maybe even 80 something. And uh, we were on our way. So it worked out perfectly. Charging session was perfect on that one too. Um, so I monitored all that data too. But so far from what I'm seeing, like pretty, pretty happy with the performance of it. And it hasn't inconvenienced me. Um, during during my road trip yeah. so far but i have more to come on uh going to florida so we'll so, see so if far, i jump on any other networks so far so good uh and we will hear more next week but i'm glad it's good and on that it's time for tesla news Ooh. tesla news Ah, the land of Elon Musk and his many, many, many cars and many promises uh tesla news to be uh not 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 loads and loads and loads, uh, but first is a bit of a, a, a call out to those of us, uh, to those of you in the audience. Um, have you got a Cybertruck reservation? We'd like to hear from you, basically, because customer deliveries are supposed to start on November 30th and rumours and speculation are going a little bit wild about how it's all working. Uh, what they're saying, what's available, what isn't available. Obviously, they said limited uh, limited production this year with a big ramp up next year, and they're going to hit 70 gajillion cars by 2026. Um, so far, there's been a few kind of people pop up on, on X.com, the artist formerly known as Twitter, um, uh, an, an anonymous participant of, of some forum, uh, Tesla Cybertruck, says, oh, I've, I've got a, a first 500 reservation. I had a call today from Tesla asking if I wanted to move forward with purchase. Only two options available for initial orders, dual or tri-motor and autopilot tier. Selected tri and FSD at a $7,000 lock-in. Not everyone will be locked in this price. The total price was $98,990 plus $7,000, which is a little bit more. Um, uh, and then, Lacey, I know we were talking about this ahead of time, um, but there was someone who had has 69 Cybertrucks on order, and because he has so many on order, they were going to be cancelled. Yeah, so I just dropped the, actually the link in there in the in the chat, but the guy said, Tesla just canceled my Model Y. I was labeled as a reseller because I have 69 Cybertrucks on order and sold my Model S before I deployed for the Space Force, question mark. I didn't realize that Tesla could read my mind and or that rental business was against the terms is I think what he meant. So yeah, um, yeah. yikes. So if, if you're out there, you've got a Cybertruck order, we want to hear from you because we want to know what's going on and we want to tell people what's going on. So if you would ever so kindly get in touch with us uh, at uh, team at insideevs.com, we'd be very appreciative because we want to hear what you've got to say. Um, in more Cybertruck news, um, oh, this is, this is some weird dystopian future stuff. Uh, so a Cybertruck was spotted uh, driving along uh, motorway, the freeway with bullet holes inside of it. Oh, well, not bullet holes, sorry. Um, just dents, uh, like bullet what you dents. get in movies. Bullet dents. Um, and someone, someone tweeted, yeah, a cyber truck seen the highway potentially gone through bulletproof testing, uh, seen by a member of the 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 Tesla owners club. 
Uh, Elon Musk replied to this saying, we emptied an entire drum of Tommy gun, of a Tommy gun into the driver door, Al Capone style. No bullets penetrated into the passenger compartment. Um, you know, Tesla said for ages that the Cybertruck would be bulletproof. However, um, Jay Jarvis of the Atlanta-based Armour Forensics, um, I've got the story out because I need to read his quote quite, uh, quite it's, he's, he knows what he's on about. The size and impact mark suggests a Thompson 0.45 uh, auto machine gun. Um, I do not see any penetration, but keep in mind the 4.5 auto has a muzzle velocity of less than 1,000 feet per second. Um, and he would rather have seen them shoot it with a 0.223 or a 5.56 mil uh, bullet um, or a 7.62, a 39 mil bullet, um, because they're more common than a Tommy gun. Uh, because that's a weapon from the 1930s or the Musk. I was going to say, is Al Capone doing a lot of hits uh, in um, 2023? Uh, a, a lot of them very quiet, I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he basically, he's, he's uh, Jarvis has said he was expect he would expect high velocity rifle bullets um, to, uh, to 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 more accurate. And this is again, it's a weird thing to say in 2023 to more accurately represent the kind of ammunition that you might get shot with. Um nice. Yeah, I mean that's that that's what that that's what's being be, being expected. So yeah, by the looks of things, if you do find yourself Star Trek style going through the gate at, at the edge of tomorrow, um in 1930s uh, Chicago in your Cybertruck and they fear they fear <laughs> thank you, producer Danny, for the comment Cybertruck built for the front lines of World War One. Um, <laughs> yeah exactly um, yeah you know it's, um, if, if you find yourself in 1930s chicago great prohibition bit boring but uh but yeah uh friends, if you if you fill your cyber truck with moonshine then like the mob mob ain't gonna touch you i don't know how you're charging it but like the, okay well, but know, why the didn't things? they shoot the glass with this hmm. mm, probably because well, the glass I, ain't as we saw before when they threw a ball at it the glass is probably not going to be yeah that's know. a really good point actually because so when i well, went first. to bmw's armored uh oh, yeah did division, you see the sentinel uh no i saw a um a hydrogen <laughs> x5 so that they set off 24 hand grenades underneath because like that's a normal thing to do isn't it um but uh they had a lot of um glass that had been hit by bullets and the glass obviously is very very thick and it almost sort of curves in it bends um but there's no evidence here i mean that's a really clean just shooting the sides mm -hmm. not well yeah, um, don't hit the glass hurry don't 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 do it because you know oh, we can't see what happens there shoot it well uh, f f further further to that in uh in in the story on inside evs.com do check it out um Obviously, quite quite famously, the armored glass uh, didn't work uh, at the unveil in 2019. But a couple of years later, Tesla painted a multi-layered armored glass that can apparently withstand a two joule impact with only a 10 percent rate of failure. So if someone's very angry at you and throws nine balls, there's a good chance that the glass won't break that tent, though. A bit knackered, but um, yeah, this well, is. Well, let, let me just mention real quick. The only thing I really just don't like about this is that this p might potentially encourage people to damage people's cars. Like I saw a video of like someone recording on their Sentry mode of someone going to like scrape the side of a Model Y, and their reasoning that they were going to do that was because they don't like Elon Musk. But if there are more reasons like that, or like visuals like this that people want to test it out, like on somebody's like that's just. Mm. I wouldn't want to be an owner that has to deal with that kind of stuff. I don't know. No. That's just my thought of it is like, d d d do we really need to try to, I get you're trying to prove a point, but also I don't want to encourage people to be damaging to test this out. <laughs> I mean, my, my, my very, very uh, European brain is struggling to get around the need for a daily bulletproof car outside of being the leader of a state. Uh, <laughs> But so it's like, yeah, it'll do yeah. this. I, I, again, I remember this, this. I remember the tweet vividly. The guy's like, well, I know I'll be fully protected driving down, driving down the road in my cyber truck. Like, who have you 
irritated so much that they want to shoot you apparently with a weapon from the 1930s also um, repairing this like what a nightmare like okay yeah you shoot it up but then like what about like getting it fixed after <laughs> like, mm. uh, like that's not gonna come out is it it's stainless no. steel and yeah, it's three millimeters thick mounts. Or those that th those those five minute crafts you see on on social networks where they get loads of glued yeah. things and then just yank it all up a painstaking hideous process. Um, anyway, as uh, as 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 Steve filler, yeah, oh yes, yeah, stainless filler. As Steve Beer said in the comments, the third view section offers fit often feels rather like the Onion. Steve, you're not Indeed. wrong, my friend. And on that, that is our time for the week. Uh, so do remember to tune in same time next week for more EV news. Perhaps they've uh, launched a Cybertruck off of a cliff uh, a la the Citroen Traction event in the 1920s to prove how strong it was. Uh, it, was a, it was a fun, fun publicity stunt then. Uh, and it will be a fun publicity stunt now. Um, but thank you so much. For tuning in for joining for submitting your comments uh if you would like to talk to us and send us anything on the sly not in a public comment section you can always email us a contact at insideevs.com for now thank you so much to miss go electric lacy thank you so much thank you thank hazel you southwell thank you to our producer behind the scenes the lovely danny howard uh and as ever i've been alex goy and we will see you next week bye 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 <laughs>